Good evening. Everybody go ahead and stand and grab your hymnals. Turn to page 192. Page 192. We're singing one day, singing three verses. Go ahead and join me on that first. One day when heaven was filled with his praises. One day when sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. Dwelt some a man, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Living he loved me. trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glory will shine wonderful day my beloved ones bringing glorious savior this jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins for ask his blessing for this evening. Dad, would you pray for us tonight, please? Man, you could be seated. A few real quick announcements to make mention of. I think many are probably aware, but please look um, on the Facebook, also our website uh, pertaining to the steps that we're in. We're in step number two, um, and I was that this way last week, and through the rest of May, through uh, this next weekend also, and then uh, step number three will begin. Uh, in on the first Sunday of June, and we will get back to having Wednesday night services. We'll get back to running buses and having kids church and um, all of that kind of thing. I, I, I feel like since we don't have as many young people and we don't have teens and all that, it seems like we're kind of quieter. Have you noticed that? You like come in and you feel like, okay, I need to talk like this while we're in here. And that was never the case, you know, but uh, throughout this month, uh, it has uh, kind of felt that uh, way. Um, so, 
I have not read up. You can inform me if, if it has happened. I've, I've heard that we're supposed to use a sanitizer, uh, that people can use masks. A lot of restaurants, a lot of places like that. Many of the people that work there are using those. Um, also, the social distancing. I heard that that takes place. Uh, we have done that in classes and things like that. You go into a place and they're six feet apart. We have blocked off every other pew here and those kind of things. You're supposed to not shake hands. You know, way back there they said, hey, let's just remove that from our culture for now on or something along those lines. And that's going to be kind of odd. I guess we have to go back to greet each other with a holy kiss. Wait, that's closer than shaking hands, holy kiss, right? So maybe not do that. Um, and I heard of all those various things that have taken place. But I... I haven't heard a regulation, and I don't know if we as Christians could actually abide by a regulation that said, thou shalt frown all the time while you're social distancing. You know what I mean? Or thou shalt not have enjoyment during this time. Or thou shalt be quiet according to the guidelines. No, we, we still have an opportunity to, uh, praise the Lord, we still have an opportunity, at least for today. It might change by next weekend. They might try to take that away also. But um, we have an opportunity to praise the Lord, enjoy it, um, and enjoy what God can do in our life and uh, while we go through uh, this situation. So we're working through those phases and take a look at that. Also want to make mention, next Sunday is going to be uh, the Stones last Sunday here, Sunday night. Uh, we will be having an opportunity where you can bring some cards. You can uh, greet them and uh, wish farewell to them. Also, a place uh, going to Brahms, have a little bit of fellowship if you're interested in that. Uh, next Sunday night also, Brother Gus will be preaching. We're going to be doing something special in that fashion also with his graduating from college and that connection there. So uh, mention that to folks, pass that along, and uh, make sure that that gets... Uh, uh, the word gets out. We've attempted in a variety of ways to get word out on uh, all kinds of different announcements throughout the, the course of this past two months. Um, but not everybody has Facebook. Not everybody goes to the website. Not everybody keeps up date with that. Um, I am amazed at how many questions that I get. Uh, and I have to remind myself, wait a second, uh, maybe that, I know we put it out in like eight different ways, um, but maybe people didn't see those things. And um, so make sure to pass it along. Uh, let's use word of mouth or texting to let people know. Um, pertaining to uh, next Sunday and having that fellowship in that evening, okay? And then also, the 14th of June will be our uh, promotion Sunday. Keep that in mind. Uh, take place for all the young people moving up in classes. And then Sunday night, those that are graduating or have graduated, it's kind of odd, um, you know, they graduated, but they don't, didn't have a graduation. Uh, that's how Brother Gus, he graduated, but really he's not going to graduate till August. That's when he actually walks across the stage, right? Yeah, yeah. No, but he's actually graduated, but just for the uh, uh, processional and uh, the commencement time frame uh, hasn't taken place for many. Um, but uh, we will have an opportunity to honor them, as you see up here, taking that opportunity on that same Sunday as we do uh, the promotion Sunday. We'll do that during the Sunday evening service. And then the last thing I want to make mention of has to do with youth camp. You can look at some details there in your bulletin uh, to be filled in about that, okay? All right. Um, anybody have a praise that they want to mention? Just something that um, uh, you say, hey, there have been lots of prayer requests. I've had things that I've had to deal with and uh, things that are out of the ordinary and a little turmoil here and there. Anybody have anything that they just want to thank the Lord for? Go ahead, Carol. Wow, congratulations, wonderful. Um, so you had your second great-grandbaby, boy or girl? Girl, girl. name? J.D. Lynn? Jaylene, Jaylene, okay. And how old is she? <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> it's like you ask her details and you think, wait a minute, what do you mean? All right, anybody else want to thank the Lord uh, for something? Just uh, off the top of your head, I know I'm putting you on the spot this just a little bit. Go ahead, Parker. All right, yay, he got him a truck. Had to take a look at that. It's parked, what would you say, over here? Okay, so make sure to take a look at that on your way out and swing by there and uh, see that truck that he got this past week. Go, Charles. Yes, uh, lots of shoe polish horn? Shoe polish horn? For his truck. For his truck. Oh, cool, okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, so grab some of that on the way to the truck. Um, I'm going to ask Brother Gus this. Um, I already know the answer, but I'm going to ask him. Um, so they should use, like, the white shoe polish and put it on the tires of his truck. Is that correct? correct. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you remember they did that with uh, their wedding, and it does stain tires for, like, permanently <laughs> for a good while. So don't do that, okay? Don't, don't take that approach. Um, I don't think Parker would uh, like you anymore. He might have bad thoughts about you, so don't do that, okay? <laughs> All right, somebody else? Anybody else says thank the Lord? Yes, go ahead, Santa. 
Amen. I had some other people that mentioned me taking a nap. And you know my next question to them? So did you dream about anything? <laughs> it's just a weird question. <laughs> Get this. Okay. Um, it, we're just like usins here, okay? Uh, Brother John Morales. I thought this was his coolest idea. About two months ago, he told me that uh, he said, you know, people always walk up and say, uh, hey, how you doing? How's life been? And uh, he said, you know, I'm trying something new. He said, just ask them something off the wall. They walk up and they say something to you, and um, you say, hey, you know, I was wondering, what do you like on your pizza? <laughs> I mean, it's just something different to kind of get to know people a little bit more. And I thought, that's cool. So I've started doing some of that myself. Has he done, does they do that with you at all? Oh, yeah. Hey, all the time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I thought it was a cool thing. Um, so that's why I thought, have you, did you dream anything while you took your nap? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Thank you to the Lord. Uh, I see. Yes, but Charlie. Hey, all right. House finances and music in order. Wonderful, wonderful. So once the finances, house finances are in order, then you can play some music and rejoice about it, right? There you go. Good, good, good. Thank the Lord for that. Anybody else? Just to thank you to the Lord? Yes. John headed to Houston. Yes, thank the Lord. <laughs> Brother John headed out yesterday from Oklahoma. He then flew to Florida. So he went over, um, what is that, Louisiana and Arkansas, or Arkansas and Louisiana, maybe Mississippi, maybe his way down to Florida to pick Amy up, got in a car uh, last night and then drove down to the southern part of Texas, Houston, Texas, um, and got there finally uh, today. Uh, so thank the Lord uh, they are there at a town called Haiti. Or praise that. That is a John also. They were going to and that kind of stuff. Uh, so be in prayer for them. They'll be heading out, I guess, in the morning or tonight or in the morning. In the morning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He mentioned staying at the pastor's house there. So heading out in the morning to long, long trip um, to bring back a very precious. Right? right. Yeah. Very much so. Bring Amy back here. Thanks to the Lord. All right. I thought that would be a very fitting. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, he said it. He said it too early. He's lived in Texas too long, and now he's living in Oklahoma, and he's talking about not having a No. <laughs> Thank the Lord for that. You know, normally it does happen during that first day, so we, we've pretty much made it all the way through there, but we are going to have a lot of storms this week, so take precautions if need be. be I'm going to do my best David Payne impression. I need a little bit of hair to comb over there. <laughs> Best David Payne. Stay weather aware. Stay tuned to not, uh, News 9. And we have the best Doppler, Doppler. It's like this big and this tall. It's better than anybody else. Anybody ever get that from David Payne when you're watching? Yeah. <laughs> what they got is always great. But they, they use it. So, all right. Good, good, good. Thank the Lord for that. Any other? Just thank the Lord. Okay. I thought. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed somebody. Yes. Amen. Thank the Lord. It's always nerve-wracking when you're in that uncertain time frame, okay? When they're saying, well, wait till the test results. Good, good, good. Thank the Lord for that. Anybody else? Okay. You see the song up here? I thought us just thanking the Lord would make a wonderful time frame with this song connection. The Lord hath done great things for us. Let's stand together. We'll sing this chorus two times. Uh, page number 749. Page 749, come and join me on that purse. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. He cannot fail, his word is true, we're trusting him, he'll see us through. The Lord time. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. He cannot fail, His word is true. We're trusting Him, He'll see us through. The Lord has done great things for Over the page 291. It's 
91 High of Ground, singing all three verses. Go ahead and join me on that first. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. So praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith is caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I On the last. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher Go with prayer. Ask his blessing on the offering. But Charles, can you pray for us? Amen. You can be seated. Stand through one last time. Take your hymn books. Turn to page 614. Page 614 in the service of the king. We'll sing three verses. Go ahead and join me on that verse. I am happy in the service of the king. I am happy, oh so happy. I have peace and joy that nothing else can bring. service of 
lovely king. I am happy, oh so happy. All that access to him I gladly bring in the service of the king. In the service of the at this time. Mr. Dean will bring us her special this evening. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord. I 
hope that you have already or possibly will. I'm getting a little bit of feedback there. See what's going on. Um, can we mute the pulpit? Might be the battery. Oh, the batteries on this is out. All right, just bring the pulpit back on until he gets this changed out. All right. On this uh, particular weekend, of course, being Memorial uh, Weekend, I hope that um, you've already taken opportunity. If you haven't, then please do so. Uh, today or tomorrow, um, just to truly thank the Lord uh, for the freedoms that we have here in the United States and those that willingly uh, gave their the greatest life sacrifice uh, for us to enjoy those freedoms. That's what Memorial Day is all about, um, is remembering the soldiers who have fallen for us to be able to have uh, the freedoms that we get to enjoy. And I think the best way that we can truly approach that is to try to um, just enjoy those freedoms and at the same time realize that we might be called also to stand up for those freedoms um, ourselves. And so to appreciate them and to handle them in a right way um, is a way that we can as Americans choose to acknowledge that sacrifice um, that each uh, was willing to give. Now of course Memorial Day uh, is not a, uh, a worldwide holiday, it is a, a national holiday, it's here in the United States. And so um, nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt um, abide by Memorial Day. But uh, we are to thank God when God brings blessing to us. And for the nations that we get to enjoy, God has set up those nations. And so there's no reason for us not to take the opportunity to be uh, people of a national uh, direction. And uh, thank the Lord that way. So um, take that opportunity, if you would, uh, to truly, uh, to truly uh, let, uh, make sure we're on again. All right, are we coming through on this one now? Coming through on, do we have a main one on? It doesn't sound like it's coming through. There's nothing working on this. Now we don't get anything. All right. Just a second. Switch to lapel number two, if you would, and we will attempt it that way. All right. Are we uh, all set now? All working good? Everybody can hear okay out there? All right. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so just take that opportunity this weekend. And let's strive to uh, truly thank God uh, for the freedoms that we get to enjoy. Okay, let's take our Bibles out and stand as we're doing that. We're going to go to the book of Philippians. Philippians uh, chapter number 1. Philippians number 1 is where we're going to be. Um, we're going to begin reading in verse number 3 and go down through verse number 8. You'll recognize at least 3 and 4 uh, since we covered those last time. But we're going to specifically be in 5 through 8. But I want to begin reading in verse number 3. The Bible says this, verse number 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. So this is Paul talking about a group of believers that he was not with, but he had been. He had seen the church in Philippi uh, started, and now he's writing back to them years later. Verse number 5. Being confident of this very thing, so in this prayer, thanking God, he makes these statements. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, I have you in my heart. Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation... Uh, of the gospel. Ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels 
of Jesus Christ. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for how you can speak to us, how you can deal with us, how you can point us in a good and right direction. Help us to truly strive to hear what you want to say to us and how you want to deal with us personally. I do pray for those that are sick, not able to be with us, those that um, are looking forward. I um, heard from so, so many that wish they could be here, but not until the beginning of June. And I pray that you just take care of them during this time also. For those that are traveling because of this holiday weekend, and then those that are, um, those that are hurting, like the Jacobs family, please um, draw them unto yourself. And we lift each one of these up to you, knowing that you uh, know the details a whole lot better than we do. And I pray that um, you, can, you will do uh, what only you can do. We're going to trust you for that. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Be seated. Thank you so much. Well, we're involved in this series. You see right here, a joyful, a generous, and content life. Um, choose to go after being generous. God has not admit it very often we might not acknowledge it very often but we have a tremendous blessings that God has given to us that we get to enjoy and are we're called if we're going to have the joy of the Lord in our life to be generous with how he has blessed us to then be content with what he has supplied to us and so as we come down to this section you recognize as Paul was um, uh, as we made mention as he was praying for these believers remember this was written to Christians um, he was praying for these believers, and he lifted up pertaining to them and uh, his gratitude, uh, making a request for joy toward the Lord because of their previous actions, because of how they were choosing to live their life, because of their personality influence, and yes, constantly different personalities than what he had, but they sought to be an encouragement. They sought to uplift. They sought to be a help uh, in that approach. And then we see, as we come down to verse number 5, he says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now, being confident of this very thing. There's a book that was written a number of years ago called The Blessing. And in it, maybe you recognize uh, these individuals. Gary Smalley, he wrote a, a book having to do with the love, love languages um, that was very uh, useful uh, to couples for many, many years. It's been around for a really long time. And also John Trent. Uh, they were both instrumental uh, in this book, The Blessing. And he, there's an event that is recorded in there about a young man named Brian. And Brian, um, he desired more than anything uh, for, to have encouragement uh, to have approval, to have a good job kind of an approach, to have a blessing from his dad. His dad never did that. His dad was a military man. He had served all his life in the Marines. and uh, It's as though Brian wanted to hear from his dad. Get this. I mean, some of us, this might be totally foreign. He simply wanted, and here's how the quote is put down, to hear, son, I love you and I'm proud of you. But he had not heard that. He did not hear that because of his dad's background. Now, his dad did a lot of other things that were seeking to uh, affect and help Brian. And with that, his dad desired him to follow in his footsteps. And uh, he uh, tried to instill much discipline into Brian, kind of give him a backbone that uh, he would need to be an eventual an officer in the military also. And, um, but throughout his growing up time frame, the idea of the words of, uh, of love or tenderness, that just wasn't part of their um, connection. It uh, just never was uh, pointed toward Brian. So Brian graduated from high school and enlisted in the Marines. Uh, it, it, this is how it was put down. Um, and Brian was the one giving this information. How it was put down um, that this was, was the happiest day in his dad's life. Because he had enlisted in the Marines and he was following in the direction of uh, his father. Now, what happened, though, is that joy that the dad had was rather short-lived didn't seem to last very long because weeks into his basic training, he um, had had many attitude issues. He had many attitude problems. He just could not handle authority, could not deal with authority, constantly back against authority. And what ended up happening is not even getting through basic training, he ended up getting into a major spat with a drill instructor and uh, physically attacked the drill instructor. He wasn't, after he had been marked down for his attitude against authority over and over and over and over again, 
then what came out was when he attacked the drill instructor, that was the last uh, opportunity. And he was dishonorably discharged from the Marines, not even completing basic training. The news of that um, happening to Brian uh, came to his dad, and it was the death blow to their relationship. Dad said, um, don't even bother coming back here. I don't want you in my house ever again. And so there was no contact happening with Brian and his dad for many, many years. And through this, uh, Brian struggled with much of feeling inferior. Uh, he struggled with uh, just not having self-confidence. It, it showed itself in a lot of different ways. Um, he had extremely high intelligence, way above average intelligence, um, but he, he couldn't keep going with a job because he fought authority. He fought authority. He fought authority. He fought authority. He always had something of reasons why they were wrong. And in that fighting of authority and in the connection of what he missed from his dad, you put those two things together and he went from job to job and they were always extremely low, menial jobs, way below his intelligence. He got, um, he had three very serious girlfriends. Got engaged, and more than that, but he got engaged to three. Called off the engagements within weeks of the weddings three times. He just could not commit in that way. He just did not seem to grasp a hold of the idea that somebody could care for him. And it just grew and grew and grew as he got older. Now, after um, a good number of years, he had been suffering and been desiring all the way from childhood of this uh, somebody to show some encouragement, some approval, some blessing toward him. And that just wasn't coming. And he heard... Um, from a contact of the family that his father had had a heart attack and, there was, and he was very close to death. And so Brian got in an airplane, he went there, and while he was going there, here's what he says. He says, I was filled with hope. I thought, uh, or even at the end of uh, my dad's life, um, I hope we can be reconciled. I hope I can get, we can get this stuff worked out. He arrived, um, but he arrived too late. His dad had slipped into a coma. And uh, the words that he longed for, the desire that he wanted, the wanting that acceptance from his dad just wasn't coming. He was there for four hours, Brian was, and uh, there at the hospital, and his father died after him arriving, after being there for four hours. Never regained consciousness. They were never able to communicate. And here's what took place. At the deathbed, his father now deceased, Brian stood there, and here's how he put it in his own words. And he kept saying, and I kept saying, Dad, please wake up. Please wake up. Not yet. Not yet. And years later, reflecting back on that, the recognition that not having that encouragement, that approval from his father, from his family, from those from the youngest age, caused him to create situations. The approval had no reason to come as he grew. Because he took this pattern of dad was the authority, he didn't give me the approval, so I'm going to buck all authority now. And that became the pattern of his life. He needed, he needed somebody to be an encouragement. He needed somebody to be a give a blessing to him. He needed somebody to show some approval, someone to bless his life. And when I say bless his life, all that is is speaking well of somebody, lifting somebody up, encouraging somebody. There's a song that uh, we don't sing very often, but maybe you're familiar with it. It says, Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Here's how the chorus goes. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. Out of my life may Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray. I pray thee, my Savior, make me a blessing. So what you have is this idea of we as Christians have an opportunity to see the Lord use us as only he can. But he's not going to force us. He won't force he won't force us to the fact that he is what I have. He will use that to be a blessing to somebody else. It's what he intended. 
But he doesn't make us do that. He, we get his blessings, we get what he brings to us, and we get to decide how generous we're going to be with it. Are we going to actually use that to be a blessing to somebody else, or are we, are, are we not? Now, when we come back to this passage of Scripture here in Philippians, as you see Paul writing to these believers, we started off, uh, we read 3 and 4, but uh, where we're picking up in verse number 5, he said he was grateful for your fellowship. See that your fellowship in the gospel. A fellowship, and then we have the idea of confidence. In fellowship, confident because of what God was doing, the blessing that God was bringing uh, to them. And here's the thing. He saw their consistent fellowship, their dependable fellowship, something that he could thank the Lord for that continued on and continued on and continued on and continued on. Now, in that joyful confidence, in that confidence that he had for what God had done, it wasn't that he was confident in himself or he wasn't just praising himself or he wasn't just praising, um, sometimes we're real good at praising our, our, uh, our child or our mom or our dad, brag, brag, and brag, say all kinds of stuff pertaining to them. But how often do we use the opportunity to be a blessing to somebody? Not that with us, he's a blessing to somebody, not just his family. He's a blessing to us as individuals. Now, when I say not just his family, think about this. Not just the idea of us picking and choosing who we're going to be. God doesn't pick and choose. What he does is he reaches out to encourage every single person who knows Christ as their Savior that has been adopted into his family. That's what the Bible deals with, adopted into the family. But long before a person was saved, he still sought to bring help and encouragement and uplifting to us. And then we see that mushroom or blossom once a person's saved. Whether a person acknowledges God or not, God is desiring to be a blessing in their life. You say, I don't know about that. The reason they get another breath is God being a blessing. Before you knew Christ as your Savior, he, you were being blessed by God to get to continue breathing, to keep, get to continue having another opportunity to trust the Lord. So let me ask, are we seeking to be a blessing to people? Do we ever cry out and say, Lord, make me a blessing? Or here Paul was being grateful for that fellowship, that way that they could know that, that opportunity of how God had blessed their life. And so now he was going to seek after um, a, a direction of, uh, or encouraging them in the way of how they had chosen to go that direction too. But notice verse number uh, six as it continues. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. So in that fellowship, that confident fellowship that he's thanking the Lord for because of how God has blessed them, he took it further to the point where he really does focus and think on what God is doing, what God has done. That it wasn't them that began this great work in their life. It was the Lord. It's this, uh, the idea of, of this very thing, that he which hath begun. It was the Lord that began. It was the Lord that began this work in uh, uh, Paul's life and also in another person's life. It was the Lord in their lives here at Philippi. And so the Lord began to do this, and it wasn't his own work. It was his good work. It was his good effort that he had in Paul that, that he sought to do in the life of each one. He sought to grow up as believers. You think of a young person growing up. What is a parent supposed to do? They're supposed to strive to help them grow and become more productive and uh, uh, be a greater benefit. Is that? Be a greater benefit uh, to uh, people that are learn things. And that's what the Lord tries to do with us also, to help us to learn, to grow upon him. It's a good work that he has begun. But notice the phrase. Which has begun this work in you. Uh, You know what that is? It's saying that the Lord is the one who will have the power to do it and will do it. <laughs> that idea that comes to the process is something that the Lord is going to complete. He is going to execute it. He is going to fulfill it. He is going to accomplish it. This verse is eternal security in a nutshell. <laughs> it is a passage of scripture that says, I'm not saved by my own. I don't keep myself saved. He I can rely upon him. But it was so much more than that because he was talking to people who were saved. He was talking to believers and how God began a work in them and they could then, as they had in the past, rely upon him continually in that work going forward. That he will complete it, he will perform it.
in that performing of what the Lord was going to do, we can easily begin to fight against what God wants to do. Now pause here. This isn't the point of the message, but I have to include this part. The fact that he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, there are two different um, directions, that are wrong directions, that sometimes people take this verse to be led. One is this. Well, God's going to perform it. It's up to him. I have nothing to do with it. And it leads in a direction of Calvinism. It leads in a direction of it's already decided. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what takes place because um, who knows what's going to happen. God does. And what he knows is going to happen anyhow whether I go along with it. Okay, that's one. one. The idea of, of, uh, not the, uh, idea, but the idea where people are buying into uh, God's going to do this and remove themselves from it. There's a second problem area that is grasped. And actually, the taking of the first and holding it up to its natural conclusion. If I'm believing that God is the one who will do this. You know where it leads people? It leads them this way. It leads them in a direction of a very passive Christian life. They stop doing anything. They stop serving. They say, ah, it's going to happen anyhow, whether I do it or I don't do it. Now, that part is that a person can grab a hold of that this is of God and remove themselves from it. But remember what Paul was... This is the problem... Remember what Paul was saying. He was praying about what had already occurred in these people's lives and how grateful he was because of their fellowship and the confidence of what God was going to perform. So if we remove ourselves from it, what happens? We say, I'm going to look to God. Great, that sounds wonderful. But he's looking and expecting us to follow his lead, to do as he's instructed us to do, not Let's, say, let's see what God's going to do. People sometimes take the idea of wait upon the Lord as though I'm going to sit back in my recliner, prop my feet up, and wait and see God do something. That's not what it means at all. It means to wait for God to do something. Wait, wait on a direction. Serve. That's what the word is. It's the idea of us doing what's right before the Lord. We're waiting on the Lord to give direction about something else. Same is true in the Scripture, the idea of he's going to perform it. But it doesn't make us enjoy or endure his performance. Once we're saved, we're saved. Thank the Lord for that. That's the promise of God. He can't go back on his nature. He can't go back on his character. We are saved eternally. Thank the Lord. But whether it's a good work that continues in our life, that's what we choose. Decide. So, we look at this passage of scripture and we find there's a confidence that we can trust in him, we can rely upon him, we can look to see what he's going to do, that this doesn't happen in Christians' lives. Vigils. And I think there's probably a lot more than what we think. And we should examine and make sure we're not one of them. To know Christ, they know a lot about Christ. It's just there's no change of actually desiring God to work in their life. And here's a sad par possibility. If it's just professing and just knowing, maybe it's not even saved. Not even know Christ as their Savior. Prof but never actually accepting him. Never actually recognizing, I can't do anything on my own. I'm a sinner. You're my. But going through life knowing about him, saying that they were, this happened. This occurred. I, 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 I got saved back in the time frame. 
but not knowing him. The problem is that amounts to nothing. Um, Ms. Connie Carraway hasn't uh, been able to come to church for a number of years. Some of you probably have met her. Some of you probably never have. And she uh, had a stroke, and it left her very um, uh, unstable. So she has difficulty getting around and walking around, those kind of things. Some of you who do know her are aware of that. One of the amazing things, Miss Connie, this is her own testimony. I've heard it a number of times. She served right here in this church. Her husband was a deacon right here for many, many years. Now she was involved in all kinds of activities and events of the church, helping out all the time. Miss Connie always sat right back over here. One time there was uh, an evangelist, I'm not sure exactly who it was, that was preaching. He preached on this idea of examining yourself, make sure that you know Christ as your personal Savior. And the most amazing thing happened. Miss Connie um, came forward. After decades of being a deacon's wife and involved in a church, she recognized, I don't know the Lord the way that people know the Lord. <laughs> I know Lord, but it doesn't show my actions. Oh, she was doing stuff. Just her approach to life was completely opposite of a person who knows the Lord. So she actually accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior, as an older lady, having served in a church for many, many, many years. You know what that took? Humility. She had to get over her pride of but I've been saved, I know the Lord, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, and had to recognize Maybe my works, my fruit, isn't showing that I know Christ as my Savior. And she accepted Christ as her personal Savior. Some of you know that testimony, some of you don't. And the amazing part of that, that's happened many, many times in people's lives, when they've evaluated themselves and truly asked, do I know Christ? Am I serious? Do I know Christ? So one of the reasons why often we don't see God performing the work in our life is because maybe we know of him, we have a profession of him, but we've never actually accepted Christ. Let me ask you, don't wait. We heard about a major demonstration of that this morning, that life is so short. Don't put off if you don't know Christ as your Savior. Those of you watching on live stream, don't wait. Don't wait to trust the Lord. Evaluate, do you truly know Christ? Is he changing you? Is it a personal relationship? Secondly, here's the big one for us Christians. We don't see the Lord performing a good work in us because we too frequently kick and scream against the work that he wants to do in us. Because we're used to the way that we are. We know we probably shouldn't do something. I say probably because that's our mindset. We probably shouldn't function in a certain way or act in a certain way. We know it's not the best. You know it's not right. But we go ahead and go with it. We know there are things that are in the Bible that God has called us to do. And we just aren't doing it. We aren't involved in it. I mean, we're looking at joyfulness. We're looking at the idea of joyfulness. And throughout the book of Philippians, uh, you find that the joy because of people in chapter number one because of the influence of circumstances chapter two, because of the idea of emotional impact in chapter number three and then possessions in chapter number four that all of those things not being right were taking the joy out of christians lives and paul was writing to him and saying it doesn't have to be that way but here's the thing if we aren't letting the lord make us into generous people we're regularly not going to have joy we're regularly going to be barking against what the Lord wants us to do. And our opportunity is to let him make a blessing. Be confident that he's the one performing the work. Paul was saying, that fellowship that you have with each one, that desire that we have with each other, it's something I thank the Lord for and I can praise the Lord for. Real quickly, verse number 7. For me to think this of you all... Because, get this, I have you in my heart. I have you. It means he, 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 he had a concern for him in his heart, a desire for him in his heart. In as much as both in my bonds 
so when things aren't going so good, and in the defense, so that he's standing up for that and striving for it, and confirmation of the gospel, confirming the gospel is the And it says, ye all are partakers, get that? Partakers of my grace. So he talks about my grace that shown earth to each one of them, but they are partakers of his grace and how he has been from his heart showing out a desire unto them. And the final verse, notice, and we're going to link these two together. It says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus. Christ. Saying in verse number eight, God knows what's real. He knows, knows what's true. He knows what really takes place in life and how I have a desire after you and am seeking after you and wanting uh, to encourage you, to lift you up. We could say, wait, to be a blessing. Paul was acknowledging God has been a blessing to us. You guys have been a blessing and a fellowship with each other. He's been a blessing to me from a distance because he wasn't there. And then he's right thanking them for that. God be a blessing to them. They have used how God has blessed them and become a blessing and then continuing to encourage them to not let that slip, not let that stop. To move in the direction of being a partner, a partaker of my grace. This whole idea is simply this thought that they are partakers in thought and in heart about what matters most. And he said, what matters most is that fellowship that we have as believers together. You know, if Paul was going to be a blessing to the ones at Philippi or anybody else that he wrote to, for instance, or he happened to be around um, in Colossae or in Ephesus or any other place, it didn't happen by accident. And it didn't happen by him looking at how God had blessed him and drawing a conclusion of just this. Listen to all of it. Drawing a conclusion of not just, thank you, God, for the blessing. You say, well, that's a good thing to do. Yeah, I agree. But he doesn't bless us just so we can thank him for the blessing. Be a blessing ourselves. Make me a blessing. That's not me doing anything. It's saying, God, here I am. Make me a blessing. Help me to use everything that you give in a way of being a blessing. That's what God has done for us. What are we confident in? What do we have? What do we include into our fellowship? They had consistency. They had faithfulness. They had dependent, dependability. They were confident. Paul was confident that God would continue to perform and do that work in them. Why? Because they were partaking together in the grace that God had shown and continuing out of their life. Now, here's the thing, and we're done. If they stop letting the grace show out of their life, they stop seeing the effort of God performing the work in their life. If we stop letting God's grace show out of our life, if we stop having that fellowship of consistency, if we stop moving in that direction of a faithful focus upon who God is and letting it be expressed through everything that we engage in, the result will be we don't see the consistent performing of a good work in our life. Let me ask. Back before that chorus, I ask, is there anything you want to thank the Lord for? Think about all the different things that were mentioned about thanking the Lord. It's wonderful to thank the Lord. Sometimes we get it all mixed up. Um, who wants to thank the Lord? And we start thanking people. We start praising people. That's not what we're called to do when we thank the Lord. We thank the Lord. <laughs> okay? But sometimes we get it mixed up and go in a different direction with it. But when we thank the Lord... Unfortunately, sometimes that's where we let it stop. 
We can thank the Lord for how he has blessed us. Now what do we do with that? What do we choose to do to actually use it the way God intended it to be used and why he gave it to us? Complicated. Thank you, God, for this, for this, for this, for this. Whatever it happens to be, whatever comes to mind, thank you, God, for how you bless me. Now make me a blessing with how you bless me. Help me to handle it and do with it rightly. Without that, joy always seems to Thank you for being together. Thank you for an opportunity to look to you, to seek your help. I pray that we would hear how you've spoken to us. We would listen to how you've dealt with us, and we would respond to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. As the piano plays, if God has spoken to your heart, you can pray there at your seat. You can come to the front here. You can pray there in the middle section.